get started anyway. But I, I wanted to start this off before I just kind of lecture at you on all this, but uh, just discussing a little bit about just why anyone would want to do inherited retina diseases. Okay, what are the, the, because uh, I, I was thinking back about 24 years ago, I answered an ad to be one of the, uh, to be an inherited retina disease specialist here. And I'm still doing it, so. The question that I have for you is, what are the pluses and minuses of doing that as a field before we talk about what it is? So what, why would anyone want to do this or not? So anyone of you? You're like the expert in something. Like okay, like yeah, you gotta find a niche. Or... Yeah, I'm gonna talk, this is more just about the principles you know, of this. Yeah, you got when you're looking for a job a couple of years from now, you do, you know, there's a lot of, uh, we're, we're producing however many hundreds, if not a thousand ophthalmologists every year. So you have to have a niche, you know, especially if you're thinking of doing something in academics as opposed to private practice. So that's one reason. What other reasons? I mean, we can do pluses and the minuses, too. So what else? You don't see the rest of it, because that's mostly what you'll see. You'll see, like, whatever, like, in that area, because a lot of people will send you them once you get really established. And okay, yeah, so you'd be, refer again, it's still part of your niche. What about the patients? You know, are you... And this is pluses and minuses on this, so, and I can it's, kind of... It's probably difficult having people travel from around the world or the country with okay. your patients, since you have such a large catchment area. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, it's the, you are, if you're a retina disease specialist, you're, you're kind of the, the person of last resort. You know, you've been the, uh, so patients can be very appreciative coming in. You know, they've seen a lot of people, they've seen a lot of misinformation, a lot of, you know, and it's a tough disease coming in, so you are the person that they see. On the other hand, that's a lot of responsibility. That's a lot of, and it's, it can be a, a little bit of, a, you're, t you're dealing with patients where you don't always have the answers on these things. And so you have to be able to, it takes a certain mindset to actually, you know, set aside the time, talk with them. And you, as you can see, I don't think, you know, since you're, you're all pretty early in your careers, the, um, are, you haven't been in, in clinic with me yet for retina disease clinic. And there's a different, um, for inherited retina disease, there's different approaches. And you know, there are some, some of my colleagues that have all inherited retina disease all the time. You know, that is what they do, is all, all inherited retina disease. And that can have its own pluses and minuses. One is that you get very good at it and you see a lot of really, really rare disease it's a little bit, you know, we're all focused being ophthalmologists, you know, just a small part of the body. You're getting even more, more focused in just these degenerative diseases. And emotionally, it can be a little bit hard, you know, seeing that many patients that have, where you don't have that many interventions that you can do, although that is changing. But certainly 24 years ago when I started in this, there wasn't that much. So that is one approach. Um, when I was at Mass Ioneer, that's what someone like Elliot Burson, that's all he did. You know, clinic after, you know, just patients coming through, getting their ERGs, seeing this, just going through. On the other hand, I, you know, I, I've, I was surgically retina trained. I still do surgery. It's a part of my practice. I didn't want to make it my sole part of my, you know, the sole uh, part of my practice. So I saw, so right now when you come to my clinic, the, the way it's supposed to be, and I'll tell you the way it really is, the way it's supposed to be is I'm supposed to have one inherited retina disease patient, new patient per half day clinic. So that's, that's what the way that the schedule, I even have, it took me a couple of years to kind of get the schedulers to understand this, but it's just one, one, in, one new patient, one, one to two follow up inherited retina disease patients in the, in the midst of a 20 or 25 person clinic. When that happens, that's good because inherited retina disease patients, as we'll talk about in the, le in, in the slides here, take a lot of time. You know, it's not a 10 minute visit. It's, you know, it's all not quite as bad as neuro op, but it's pretty bad. You know, they, you know, it can take, if my 8.30 patient, I often, if, I often don't see until 11 o'clock because they've had all this testing, they've gone through all the steps. So you can't, if you bring in a bunch of patients, then it throws off your whole clinic completely. The other thing is that these patients take a lot of time, even after they, you know, they have, they're not, you, they're often not simple. They have lots of testing to go through. They've seen a lot of other patients. They have lots of questions. So it, 
it can easily eat up 15, or 15 to 30 minutes of your time if you don't watch out for it in your clinic. And again, you can't have that many patients to do that. So that's, what there's, that's, the, that's the, the plan. The reality is, as they just told me yesterday afternoon, they're saying, well, on your Monday clinic, you've got, three inherited, you've got two inherited retina disease, new patients scheduled at one o'clock. Is that okay? And then I look at my schedule, no, I actually have three because they stuck a, another one in there and you know, the scheduler's neuro-op put, put in a cone dystrophy as just a regular new patient. They're asking, you know, we've got this other patient, 14-year-old with X-linked RP flying in from Montana with their family. Do we cancel that patient and, you know, make them reschedule? This other patient's been waiting three months. So it's a problem, and that's going to be a problem on the clinic. Plus, I have 31 patients, so I'm already overbooked. So it's, uh, but that shows how much you can be in demand for doing this. So that's, that's the, one of the challenges. Now, why, why did I go into inherited retina disease? Well, there's a lot of, I mean, in addition to being kind of the niche, is for being in academics and doing inherited, and doing, trying to be running a research laboratory, it's a very fertile area for research, of course. You know, there's all sorts of genetics, interventions now. There's a lot of things that are going on. And it's, I've seen the evolution in 24 years from just saying, well, we, we know this, that your disease is inherited to, I think, let's see, I guess it was probably, it was during my PhD probably is when the first gene for, off the, for uh, was ever discovered for inherited retina disease. And which, do you know which gene that was or what was produced? Anyone know? ABCA4? Nope. Earlier than that even. But it's, Apo what's that? Apo-E? Nope. And it's an obvious one, you'll say. It's rhodopsin, actually. That was, really, that was really the first one. Maybe you could argue, you know, APOE was known, but rhodopsin was the first, what I would say is the first monogenic one where they could really say, for retinitis pigmentosa, except for these kind of rare syndromes, they knew, certainly for, say, gyrate atrophy, that, you know, there were some that metabolically they knew what it was. But it was really a big deal to say, for retinitis pigmentosa, a disease that affects 100,000 people, that we know a gene that causes this. If you have a mutation, you get you get this you get this disease. So that that evolved now to the fact that we have a genetic counselor. We do genetic testing on everyone, or uh, as much as we can, and we can find the the gene mutation in an awful lot of them. So you kind of take it for granted for granted, but that just wasn't known, and that was a big deal. So that's and for my research work for looking at both genetics, looking at the basic biochemistry of how, how you know, visual cycle works. Again, I don't know how much of you know my background, but for my PhD, going way back, my PhD was on the isomerization of all trans retinoids to 11 cis retinoids. That was my PhD. And that was basically, you know, it was just because it was an interesting biochemical topic to do that. Now, Eventually, I did figure out that this, and that this enzyme activity existed. I didn't figure out, it, back then the technology wasn't good enough to figure out what the protein was, but it took another 20 years. That was RP65, okay? And now RP65 is in the clinic. So, you know, you, there can be, if you look at the long picture of how all, thing, all these things work, you know, can, you can see that something that was just an interesting biochemical problem can be eventually translated. So that can be very rewarding. On the other hand, not everyone wants to do inherited retina disease. So you've got to, you, know, you have to have the right mindset. But even if you go into private practice, and, you know, and, and you're going to see these patients coming in, and, and you need to know some of it. And the other reason to know about this is it's on your boards, of course, too. You know, they ask, and it's a fertile, <laughs> a fertile set of pictures that they can throw on there. So you do need to know it. And um, so that's, that's another reason. The, and so anyway, that's kind of a, any other reasons that you would or wouldn't want to do it, do inherited retinal disease. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk more about this now. So, we'll, but we're going to talk a little bit today, it is kind of bright, yeah. So, inherited retinal diseases are generally considered orphan diseases, but if you sum them up, 
they can be a very significant part of your uh, of ophthalmology. Now, with um, I mean, the co most common ones you're going to see are retinitis pigmentosa, the big, big kind of group of diseases. But another reason to know about inherited retina disease is that there are syndromes. You know, this is, these can be signs of other problems and uh, other problems in the body. And uh, they are inherited. And now, of course, the other thing, of course, about knowing about genetics and knowing about inherited retina diseases is a lot of diseases that we have in ophthalmology that you deal with were not thought to be inherited retina diseases, but we now know are. You know, genetics is a very major <coughs> component in knowing the, the physiology. So it would be, you know, 25 years ago thinking that, that age-related macular degeneration would be an inherited disease where you could at least consider doing genetic testing for risk factors it was just not even on the radar. Um, as you'll, as you've heard me talk a little bit, and I think you know you'll be hearing more, a disease like macular telangiectasia type two that was thought to be just totally random and sporadic disease. We now know you know the first genes for that underline this condition. We're going to be we just submitted our paper yesterday on that. So there's there's much more to learn, and genetics is important as we know. Um, Another thing is that you need to distinguish between what are the really bad prognosis diseases and the ones that are not so bad. Uh, stationary retinopathies. That's a, there's a big difference to telling, to telling someone you have, you, you have a retinal degeneration and it's going to get worse and you're gonna, you might eventually go blind and need you know, huge interventions to telling someone you know, it's, you've got something, it's going to stay stable, it's not going to be, if you've adjusted to it as it is, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to impact your life much more. And literally, is you know, there is a patient that I, Nico, I think, was with me when I diagnosed this patient, where it was a 16-year-old kid came in with a retinal degeneration, referred for RP, had um, was already doing cane training, was doing learning Braille, everything. And once we did the ERG and took the history, it was clear that he had congenital stationary night blindness. Basically, I could just tell him. You're great. Go back and don't even worry about this and quit all the stuff that you're doing. So it was good to finally give them the correct diagnosis and not, not give such a devastating diagnosis. Um, we have, they're very complicated. You, know, you have to distinguish between what's affecting rods, what's in cones. The other thing that you have to think about are toxic retinopathies. You can have, uh, some of these diseases are not inherited. Some of them are literally environmental. And if you can get rid of that sort of problem you can take that will help the patient quite a bit. Again, this is going way back to when I first started here, and where basic science can come in is when I when I was studying, um, you know, studying inhibitors of the visual cycle and all these other things that I was doing for my PhD. One of the things that we had to do was uh, since I worked on frogs, is you had to anesthetize frogs. And the way that you anesthetize, does anyone anesthetize a frog ever? Or fish? Basically what you do is you take a compound called MS-222 and you throw it into a, you just, you just make a solution of this and you throw your fish or your frog in there and then they go to sleep. Okay? Wasn't a, not a big deal, but people realized and it was known then that this caused all sorts of abnormalities in the ERG. And you had to be very careful if you use this for doing ERG abnormalities. And in my first year or two, I was referred a retinal degeneration patient from Kathleen Degree, and you know I saw this thing written in that she had she had taken a history that was written MS two twenty two, and I said, well, why is this even there? You know, and I'm like the only person that would know who the, what this was. And it turned out he was a fish pathologist. And what did he do? is he would take, the, take his fish when he had to, had to study them, throw them in the vat of MS-222, let him go to sleep, then he would grab the fish out and study it. Mm -hmm. I asked him, do you, do you wear gloves when you do this? Because he was, you know, he was going, he had RP and he had all these ERG abnormalities. I said, of course not, you know, I just grab it and I do my <laughs> And so what, but the intervention I said is try wearing gloves and he got better. And that was it. And his ERG got better, and his symptoms went away. So this, and we can look at look this up. We did publish this as the toxicity of MS-222 clinically. So 
again, you know, thinking no. the basic science, and you know, I again saved his vision just by knowing this and doing the right history. So those are some of the other things that can be. Um, and then, of course, there's pseudo-retinopathies, things that aren't RP. So let's talk. The common ones you're going to see in in my clinic and in clinical practice is retinitis pigmentosus. So it's estimated prevalence, and I think this is a pretty good number, is one in 3,000. So there are three million people here in Utah. We co if you cover that, so there's you know there are about a thousand people with RP out there. So it's not it's not insignificant. It does mean that there's about three hundred th there's about a hundred thousand people with classic retinitis pigmentosa in the U.S. So does this qualify as an orphan disease? Does anyone know what the the cutoff is in the FDA? Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. So it is. It's definitely an orphan disease. The, um, it's the most common inherited form of blindness, and as we'll see, there's lots of inheritances, clinical courses, and genetic causes. And there are limited interventions available, but it's getting better. Another, this kind of reminds me as we kind of return to this, another reason to be studying inherited retina disease is if you're, and I, I don't know how many of you even have an interest in academics but in re, and research, is it is a fertile area of research, and it's actually a reasonably well-funded area of research. Okay, it's a, it's a priority both at the National Eye Institute, and there are some foundations that are very well-funded, like the Foundation Fighting Blindness, that really, because some very rich people get uh, get inherited retinal disease, and I think you know someone was pointing out to me, and I think it's true that the the number of people who are billionaires and leaders, you know, captains of industry that have RP and are legally blind is surprisingly big. So not only, you know, because people can be successful if they don't, and earlier on and can compensate for many, many years, but, you know, people like Steve Wynn, you know, who's had his own other problems, but, uh, you know, have it, Gordon Gund, you know, there's a whole series of people that are billionaires that are out there with really, really poor disease, poor vision, and they put their their money into the re into the research, so they can put this money back. So there is, um, there it can be helpful in terms of doing uh, academics. And I've seen a lot of evolution of this from a totally, you know, a totally you know, a very bad bad disease to at least being able to offer some hope to patients. So with RP, your first symptoms are, are that my patients have, and it is night blindness. And that's the first thing that they usually complain of. If you, if you take the history, there's always some exceptions. But if you ask them, What's, what, what did you first notice, even from when childhood, they'll say, I just didn't see as well as my, as, my, uh, as my compatriots. Eventually, they start developing loss of visual fields. So remember that when you're doing certifying legal blindness in these patients, if they get down to 20 degrees or less, that's when they're legally blind. What do you need to drive? I'll ask you this you know, when you're filling out the forms. What's what's in Utah? How much? How many degrees of vision do you need to drive? Yeah, 60 is the absolute minimum there. Some people, you know, the, in 90 and 120, you start getting at least some restrictions on it. But 60 is is the is the lowest limit. So there's a bit a reasonable gap between 60 degrees and 20 degrees. And I can tell you that the patients who go that the Department of Motor Vehicles misses a huge number of patients. There's a number of patients that are much lower than 60 degrees that are out there. And I do have some that are coming in that are asking for both a driver's license form and a legally blind letter for their taxes, which is really not compatible out there, if that's, if that's really true. Um, central, central acuity and cone function are often preserved, but not always. That's the thing you, you want to check on these patients. Is, is their central vision really as good as it should be? Because what else, if someone comes in with RP, what other problems can they have that are treatable? Anything? And again, these are not hard questions. So they can have cystoid macular edema. That is, tr that is potentially treatable. They can have cataracts. They get cataracts early. So you just, you know, those are things that you have to at least think of if their vision, if they're not coming in 2020 and they have classic RP. And, but of course, this is a devastating diagnosis in these patients, or can be a devastating diagnosis, and patients go on the internet and read about the worst of the worst, and the answer, and the answer is yes, 
this is a disease where if we don't have effective treatments, they can go to no light perception, and patients do, that does happen. So, you know, there's, that's not true for many other diseases like AMD. So you need to, um, we need to know just what are the, the classic signs and symptoms of this. We've already talked some about the symptoms in terms of the signs. Bone spicules, commonly seen, not always seen. You know, and that, those are the pigment clumps that you see in the periphery of the retina, typically in mid-periphery, but they can be, you can have just a few, they can be along blood vessels. It's basically a, a pathologic reaction of degenerating retina and RPE, where the RPE kind of migrates into the, into the retina and clumps there. Um, peripheral retinal atrophy is common, but that can be missed, especially in people who are somewhat, you know, depending on their pigmentation of their retina. The, um, they have waxy pallor of the optic disc and they may have optic nerve head drusen, so that's always worth looking at. Vascular attenuation occurs very commonly. Vitreous cells, or vitre at least clumps of degenerating cells in the retina are common. And then posterior subcapsular cataracts are really, really common in these patients. And does, does anyone know why? Probably not, because I don't know why either, but it's common. <laughs> You, you see that quite a bit. And then, as I said, cystoid macular edema can be hard to manage, but it's worth knowing that they, that they have, that they have uh, you know, and that's why we get OCTs very commonly. Again, again, we used to miss this all the time before the OCT era, but you want to do that because that's something that you can try treating with Dimox, you can try treating with dorzolamide, topical dorzolamide, or you can give uh, steroids, can work, but sometimes just nothing works, but there are other patients where really managing this can make a big difference for this. And then of course, um, late, in the, late in the course, the macula is preserved. So when someone comes in to my clinic on their, you know, if they have just one patient, they, my techs know what to do, or supposedly know what to do. And they, they do things right, sort of, but not always, because they're always switching around, but of course, and seeing any patient, you want to do a clinical history. You want to know what um, is anyone else in the family affected? When did this start? What are the symptoms? So you want to you want to do that first. Then you want to do a retinal examination, and the techs are supposed to, but they don't. You know, they should check color vision. I would say that happens only about half the time, because RP typically is not going to affect the cone system, but sometimes their cone rod dystrophies are more common. Or more complex things and so they should be checking that they should be checking an absolute grid they usually don't do that either but at least they know to get um, to dilate the patient and to send them at least initially for visual field testing is the thing that I, I want first now as a inherited retina disease specialist I find automated Humphrey visual fields worthless they, those are for screening glaucoma they don't go out very far right they go 24 degrees or 30 degrees back of the eye. That is not going to pick up what's going on in the periphery and seeing what's really going on for these patients. So you, I like doing a Goldman visual field, if at all possible. The problem is Neuro-Op Clinic is running at the same time as mine. They want Goldman visual fields. It just That's a big holdup. So one of the things, and this is just my preference, and the texts say, well, we have to, this, it slows them down because there's an hour wait for this and we can't dilate the patient. It's like, I really don't care. Uh, for, for, for a visual field, I don't care whether they're dilated or not. I just want to get at least a decent visual field. So I'm pretty, if it, for a clinical study, that would not be allowed, but for my, for my clinic, it, we just have to move them along. So I do that. Um, they need a dilated retinal examination. We get OCT, of course, um, and in terms of photography, my standard battery is what I say, I call them non-invasive imaging, so they know to get this, they'll order color photographs, and we have to get montage, and I have to remind them on that, because they'll come back, and I, I'm doing RP, I've seen an RP patient, they give me just a picture of the macula. They've missed what's going on in the retina. So they, they're gradually learning that we want montage. I like autofluorescence, although I would say autofluorescence is a little bit controversial in some retina especially because the intensity of the light and its blue light is a bit is a bit much for the patients and there's some people that are convinced that that's making the, 
the patient's worse. I still think it's worth getting that information. I like getting, you know, since we have the option of getting a FLEO, I like getting fluorescence lifetime imaging. And that's, you know, that's more for academic interests, but we see a lot of changes in the autofluorescence. Um, infrared imaging, those are kind of the, the basics of that. I don't get fluorescein angiography routinely on the patients unless, unless there's a reason that I'd want to. Um, and then, let's see, what else did we, and then electroretinography, I do like getting a baseline electroretinogram on patients coming in. It can help diagnostically, it can help, uh, it can help understand, it can help understand what's going on, at least initially, rule out other problems. Once they've had an ERG or if they've had it elsewhere, especially if it's really abnormal and almost down, you know, it's lost 100, you know, 90% of the, of the, of the vision, of the sensitivity in looking at that, then it's not worth continuing doing ERGs serially. But if, they, if there's some more mild patients where, they, where it's down 25% or 50%, so potentially you could get that every, every couple of years on the patients. I do like getting visual fields, if possible, every year on the patients. There's a lot of variability on a gold on a Goldman field, but it's still worthwhile. And this is just showing an example of how a patient can progress with time. I don't know if this is going to work here. Um, showing down on the bottom left corner where you get the paracentral scotomas. Eventually, they kind of complex and wrap around until you eventually get some. This is a very common field where you have central preservation and some temporal islands uh, of vision over there. And eventually, you know, if you lived, you know, in this particular patient, becoming affected in 20 years, going to 50 years, or 60 years, you can see, down to just a tiny, tiny vision at the, at the very end. So, um, electroretinography, I leave to Don Creel. You know, we have a great electroretinographer who does it, you know, can typically do it on demand, on, and so, um, but we're using this to distinguish between what's normal, what is typical RP is shown in the bottom versus how much is, is the cone system involved and how much is, um, and then, you know, there are other things like, like in general stationary night blindness where you want to have something that's a little bit different or that you want to see is, uh, is uh, behaves differently from RP. So then, the important thing now is genetics. There's almost every patient now I will try to get, uh, get some sort of genetic testing on them if possible. And the reason is to get them into the right clinical trials to, uh, and to give them better prognosis, also to inform the family of what, it, what are the other risks in the family. The problem is it can be complex. It can take a lot of time to do genetic counseling properly. It can be, and it's not well covered by insurance. In fact, you know, we kind of, most insurances won't cover it these days. But we can try, and currently we do have, uh, with, we do have access to free genetic testing. The programs kind of come and go. In the past, some, uh, some companies, uh, where they were, the company for Spark, when it was trying to find patients with RPE65 mutations, was offering a limited panel of 31 genes for free. And that was a pretty good, you know, it, it found a lot of my patients. It was nice to have that option of free t free testing. Currently, if the patients are willing to go online and sign up for something called My Retina Tracker, run by the Foundation Fighting Blindness, they can get free genetic testing, and that's a complete panel of 200 genes. And what that involves, though, is that they have to be instructed to go online, and they give away a little bit of personal information. They're supposed to. I think they're asking them to go online once a year and you know, enter their visual acuity, enter their fields, do a little bit of something so that you're getting into the registry for the Foundation Fighting Blindness. It also gives them something to kind of informally track how people are progressing just in natural history. I would say most of my patients are willing to do that. That's not that, you know, giving up that, so that small amount of, of information in a confidential manner is fine for them. So that gets them the, uh, the availability to have genetic testing, that, a panel that's worth somewhere between one and $3,000. Now they're slow, they take at least three months, and it really, really is helpful to have a genetic counselor like Emily Spoth. I don't know if you've met her yet, 
but we now have a genetic counselor. She's here three days a week, and she handles all that because as a physician, I didn't have time to teach the patients how to do this, how to kind of shepherd them through all this process. But she's doing that, and fortunately, although it's um, currently, we even get reimbursed about $300 if she does the genetic counseling, so that actually helps pay some of her salary. This program might go away at the end of this year, it might go away in nine months, it <coughs> might continue. It's an expensive program, but it's a great thing to have right now. And even for those of you at the VA, right, we can probably, for patients who really want this, we might be able to coordinate this because the genetic counseling at the VA don't, doesn't know how to do this right now. So um, when we do have to talk about the genetics, it can be, we've learned from RP and you know, we were all excited when, you know, 27 or 30 years ago when we found the gene for RP that was gonna be RP or that was gonna be rhodopsin. Well, it's turned out there are literally several hundred different genes that can cause what we think, what we call RP. There's all these inheritances, so we should have known it was gonna be a lot of different genes. And within every gene, there's, there, there can be many, many different mutations in them. So it's, it's complicated. A good genetic counselor will do, like, like I believe, will take the time and will draw out the pedigree, uh, which can be very complicated here in Utah and figure out, and we can sometimes tell, or think we know that it's autosomal dominant or recessive, although we've been, we've been fooled. You can have X-linked diseases that in a few patients, in a few cases will show up in the females and that throws everything off. You can have, um, you can have, or I mean the X-linked, yeah, that shows up symptomatic in the females and that can be just a little bit of lionization. We have the extreme case that we that I just published a year or two ago of a patient with choroideremia who actually turned out to have Turner syndrome at the same time, so she only had one one X chromosome. So that that was literally a one in 250 million chance that she had these two diseases together. So it can be complicated and it can be kind of humbling to understand as you try to figure out what's going on. And then there's a lot of patients where there's no family history. And that just means it's either recessive or a new mutation, or we don't, or maybe it's not even RP. So, for autosomal dominant is reasonably common here in Utah. About 20 or 30 percent of my RP patients coming in are autosomal dominant. Um, they're often more mild cases, and that means mainly because they have a normal copy of the gene and they have a bad copy of the gene. So something's going wrong that's either you know, a mislocalization of the protein or it's, inter it's causing aggregation with the normal protein, but something's going on that they can, that initially the photoreceptors are probably normal when they're young and eventually start dying off. The, um, so there can be variable penetrance. So in an autosomal dominant pedigree, it can look like it's skipping generations. And that's because they say, you know, when, but if you, if you go back and look carefully at the parents, maybe there is some sort of mild form of the disease. The most common defect is rhodopsin. The other one we see are RDS peripherin. Uh, ciliopathies are very are common uh, as autosomal dominant. We see a lot of splicing factors, which are things like that go by the initials PRPF831, all sorts of things like that, that are splicing factors that are abnormal everywhere in the body, but for whatever reason, the retina does not have the the backup to, to handle this sort of genetic defect, and that's the only expression of this. So, and just shown here is an example of rhodopsin, and just showing the number in red are, you know, and this is probably way out of date, just showing where the various mutations can be found. So you can see as, it, as it's going through the membrane, it can be interactions with the transduction pathway, it can cause misfolding, they're just all over the place. and. There's a lot of founder effects with dominant disease. So if you trained in the East Coast, you know, at, at, you know, if you were at, at you know, at Wills or anywhere else, they, if I talk to the retina specialist, they say it's the most common. The common one is P23H, is the is the mutation, and that one has been because it was common, and that's where the first mutations and that the first mutation found. People developed all these animal models and became this is the most important form of RP. Well, it's just one form. 
If you, I never ever see a P23H here in Utah. They never, <coughs> the families never moved here. It just doesn't exist and people say that that's, while other, I talk to people in Tennessee, they say, well, that's half of my patients. So here in Utah, everyone is a G51V. Or I'd say that is the most common one that you see. And it's just, and no one studies that, but I would say literally half, of, when literally half of my RP patients are G51V, and that has to do with the fact one founder here, probably an early Mormon pioneer, had, had that mutation and has had lots and lots of kids. So it just, you just have to be aware that there's a lot of regional differences. Um, recessive is not as common, and it's more common in cultures with a lot of consanguinity. You know, even though people, we have the reputation of being an inbred population here in Utah, we are not like uh, the Middle East, you know, where people are marrying cousins. That's where it really comes up a lot. Um, it's often severe early onset, and then one form of <coughs> recessive RP is labor's congenital amaurosis, which is basically just RP that occurs very, very early in life. Um, mutations are often in the transduction cascade or in the visual cycle. They can be multiple genes, it can be digenic, so two different pathways kind of interacting. Um, so this, you get it by, you know, typically in an uh, autosomal recessive family. If, uh, if you have a large family like they do here in Utah, maybe, you know, two or three out of eight kids might be affected and no one else in the family. That at least is a sign that you may be having, uh, maybe looking at a recessive RP. And there's a much, it's much different to diagnose a recessive RP, tell the patient there is no chance you're gonna pass this on to your children, you know, that they're gonna be affected, except that they're gonna be carrier of the disease, as opposed to an autosomal dominant diagnosis, means there's a 50% it's gonna be passed on. X-linked, um, typically males are gonna be affected, females are the carriers. These can be a variable severity, X-linked, uh, uh, the X-linked RP syndromes tend to, tend to be pretty severe, affecting kids in their, often before age 10. Choroideremia, on the other hand, can be much more variable. We know, now we know the natural history. People's vision, they, have, they lose vision early in their, in their teenage years, but they often are very functional and don't have loss of central vision until they're about 20 or 30 years old. X-linked is very important, it's becoming more important because that's a target for a lot of the drug companies right now because they tend to be large families. Again, we have some very big founder effects here in Utah for choroideremia, and that's one that you should know, you need to know what choroideremia looks like. That shows up all the time on the boards because it has such a characteristic, um, you know, drop out of the choroid, less bone spicules, X-linked. It was on my boards, it'll be on yours too. They just, they always do that. And there's a lot of things they can ask about with the inheritance and how you manage it. Um, and so, uh, but these are a little more amenable, thought to be more amenable to gene therapy. So that's, there are a couple companies that are coming up with, uh, that are in clinical trials. They've approached us, so we will probably within the next year or two be starting gene therapy, either with subretinal or intravitreal injections for this. And so in advance of that, you'll see in my clinic, you'll see a lot of patients coming through because they, these uh, companies do natural history studies first. So they, follow, they, say, they collect all the patients to see how many we really have, follow them for two years, and then as a run-in into some of their trials. Um, mitochondrial is much less common. Uh, maternal inheritance, they often have a lot of associated neurologic disease. I don't see a lot of mitochondrial patients. Uh, they tend to be more in the neuro-op uh, realm but the, you need to know these can be a little bit more difficult to diagnose and a, little, a lot more variable. And then, of course, there's syndromic RPs, and that, these are usually recessive. Uh, multiple organ, organ systems are affected. The number one that I see that's syndromic would be Usher syndrome, so you want to look at the association of deafness and blindness. The, how do we know, lots of people have hearing problems. How do I know to really suspect, separate that from, from real Usher syndrome? Does anyone know on that? It's really the thing you wanna look for is 
Uh, with Usher syndrome, typically the deafness is early and profound. So these are patients who said, you, you know, that were born deaf, they often have speech problems, etc. They may have cochlear implants. And so you want to distinguish that from someone who just said, well, you know, I'm 30 years old and my hearing's going bad, too. That, that's, that doesn't cut it as Usher syndrome, usually. It's, um, so, but it's common. We have uh, some, we have natural history trials. You'll see a fair number of Usher syndrome patients coming through my clinics. Bardet beetle uh, is another one that shows up on boards just because it has interesting and unique associations. They have polydactyly, they're not, the intellectual impairment can be a problem, their obesity, there's a number of these. And I, it was interesting, I went to, they had a Bardet beetle convention last summer. And, I, and so to have literally a hundred of them in a room, all of these patients in there. The Bardet beetle syndrome has turned out to have dozens of different genes and gene combinations, so it's a very difficult disease to deal with. So, um, Then you'll see other things. Nico has been studying senior Loken syndrome, so that's there's a lot of association of kidney disease and retinitis pigmentosa. It has to do with the fact that they're all ciliopathies, so they affect similar sorts of structures in both the kidney and in the photoreceptors. And then the rare things, goldman Favre disease, Favre's disease, Refsum disease, gyrate atrophy, that you at least need to be aware of that are testable, potentially are treatable through dietary interventions, but are certainly not common. They don't show up much on genetic testing. And then finally, there can be sporadic. They can be, which means that they can be recessive with no family history. Uh, they might be a new founder mutation, or they might be something else. So that's why we have to talk about you know, we talked about toxic diseases. Consider vitamin A deficiency. Creel is pretty good, Don Creel is pretty good at picking that up. Those patients get referred in with, uh, you know, they, he, they have some, their cone, their cone physiology is typically very well preserved, unusually well preserved, that tips them off. What are the, what's the number one cause of vitamin A deficiency here in Utah? Um, and you get it from the history, it's bowel resection. So it's some sort of bowel disease, and we pick those up periodically. It's very hard to make yourself vitamin A deficient on a Western diet here in Utah. It is possible. I've had one patient, again with that, who literally ate no fruits and vegetables ever. And it still took him 20 or 30 years to do that, to make himself vitamin A deficient. But once, once, I, once we diagnosed this, he was fine. You know, he took his vitamins and he was and he was better. The problem with the, the, his, the problem with the yeah, he's still no fruits or vegetables. Yeah. So. He's still no fruits or vegetables. No, I think he took some. I think he just took his vitamins. And so his, his dietary history when he gave it, it was, I eat a, I eat a half a banana every other week sometimes. That was it. And then he stopped. And that's that's all he ever consumed. And his wife confirmed that yes, he. All he had was meat and potatoes. That's what he had every day for every meal. So um, it was interesting. Yeah, he, the, but I really the most, mostly here, it's the bowel resection. The problem with people with bowel resection is that they're not, if you give them a big dose of vitamin A orally, they're not going to absorb it. So you have to give them intramuscular uh, intra, intra vitamin A and at least as of a couple of years ago, that a full course of that was ten thousand dollars. The price has dropped; it's now fifteen hundred, but it's still not cheap. It's better than fruit. <laughs> so, it's and it's you know it's kind of it's unconscionable how much they even charge fifteen hundred because you know that it is not not a difficult compound to make or produce. Um, then, of course, there's stationary retinopathies. We talked about that, you know, that you want to distinguish. Uh, if you can make that diagnosis, you'll, the patients are going to do okay. They just, they, they need to, they just need to take, to be, um, to pick the right jobs. There was, so, that, and, and to, and to, and they've done quite well. I would say I don't see them very commonly, but it's, I see, I diagnose maybe one or two a year that are stationary retinopathies. They have very characteristic ERG changes. They have loss of the B wave and preservation of the A wave. And so a good electroretinographer like Don Creel will 
will bring that to my attention. You know, he knows to 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 bring, you know to tell me about that and to and to uh, you know to give the patient the right diagnosis. For treatment, it, there's been a lot of evolution on this. There, it's still a tough disease. You're going to tell the patients that we don't have truly effective treatments in most cases for the patients. So they, it's going to be supportive. You, want, you don't want to give them total gloom and doom. There are some patients that say, I saw my general ophthalmologist who diagnosed with me RP and said, you're going to go blind and walked out of the room. I hope that's not really true that that really happened. But uh, you want to give them hope. You want to try to say that we're working on, the, on, the, on trying to develop new treatments that we are going to do genetic testing, we'll get you into clinical trials as best we can, and that you know technology changes. But um, we gene therapy has really has come to the clinic for RP65 mutations. The problem is there are very few patients with this. I, I have exactly two out of all of my hundreds and hundreds of patients that I've sent for genetic testing. Both of them were in their 40, between 40 and 60 years old, had light perception vision. They're not the kind, they don't do well with gene therapy. That's not going to restore things. You want to, you would love to pick up patients with RP65 when they're 8, 10 years old or younger. It's approved. The spark of the, um, the gene therapy is approved to as, as young as one year old. But you have to have the mutation. And that's been a big problem for Spark, is that they picked a disease that is too damn rare. And they charge, uh, you know, they charge a half million dollars per dose. So it's it's expensive. They've had a couple really good success stories, but it's not a viable uh, viable economically for them. The next ones, the next generation of gene therapy is going to be choroideremia X-linked RP. That's going to be that will at least start working. There's also gene therapies for RP, but you, for dominant RP, but you're going to have to knock out the bad gene and put in a new, good, and possibly put in a new, a good new gene. So that's that's even more complicated on all this. One of the problems with gene therapy is uh, the approach. You have to put it, you have to inject underneath the retina, and so that's a subretina. You're doing surgery on compromised eyes. That um, so, and subretinal injection is not a trivial process. We're involved with 4D. That's uh, is developing. They think through directed evolution, um, AAV vectors that can that can be injected intravitreally, and will supposedly penetrate into the retina. That would be great if it really works, but that that hasn't been proven yet clinically to work. It's been proved. It's shown in monkeys that it works well. The um, then there's, you know, there's stem cells. People are looking at can they introduce, uh, replace the cells underneath the retina, either degenerating RPE or degenerating photoreceptors. They've, the proof of principle is yes, you can inject cells underneath the retina and they seem to live there. Do they do anything? Do they do any, do they hook up and do their correct function? not well proven yet. So people are looking at scaffolds, and then, but, and then you have to ask, well, when should you be inter intervening? Are we intervening too late on this? And that, that's probably true, you know, that you're, that in most cases. Some of the work done by Robert Mark here and by Brian Jones has shown when you get fairly significant RP, yes, your photoreceptors are dead, and yes, you still have an inner retina, but it's all starting to miswire at this point. It doesn't, and, and once you get miswiring, and that's, you know, then even putting in your photoreceptors there, or putting in RPE cells is not going to restore what's going on if you've got totally jumbled up retina. So we probably need to be intervening earlier in the stage when that's ha than when it's happening. But then you better have, have a very safe and effective intervention because you're operating on an eye that is still functioning pretty well. So. That's, that's a, a, a problem. Some of these, either stem cells or implants that we're looking at, are just putting in growth factors that help sustain the retina better. That hasn't been proven out. That's good in principle. It works in animal models. It hasn't been proven to really be effective yet in humans. Um, then there's all sorts of people 
will throw on different um, or throw in different drugs that might preserve you know, oral drugs. So we've been involved in there was uh, valproic acid was being pushed for a little while by some researchers that that would be very good, and then all the patients, RP patients on their their social networks said, well, let's start taking the VPA because it's an approved drug. Approved drug. Finally, the Foundation Fighting Blindness stepped forward and put in a couple million dollars, and we did a randomized trial. It didn't work. So, you know, VPA is not a benign drug, and so what we had to, it took a couple million dollars to prove that it didn't work. People are looking at Tudka, which is synthetic bear bile uh, from the China, from Chinese uh, traditional medicine. It works a little bit, but you have to take grams and grams a day of a very expensive drug. And it still hasn't made it through clinical trials. And then people look at retinoids. Uh, we do one of the, actually the only nutritional factor that's gone through randomized clinical trials and shown any effect are, is vitamin A, taking large doses of vitamin A. Yeah, but the effect is so small and, and the, the risk of toxicity is enough. I don't usually encourage my patients to do that. Plus, those trials were done before any genetic testing was done. We know there's some forms of vitamin A, of RP that vitamin A should make worse. There are others where it shouldn't cause problems. So it's, it, it's not a very good way to treat RP. And then patients go on the internet and tell me about all these electrostimulation, all sorts of things, you know, stem cells, a lot of unapproved treatments that are available in the U.S. and outside the U.S. I just have to tell patients they, they may potentially put themselves at risk. They may be spending huge amounts of money and not, not getting much for it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of doing proper clinical trials. And you always have to be suspicious of people who advertise on the internet, you know, I did this and you know, for five, you know, I'll only charge you 5000 or $20,000 for your stem cell treatment or your electrophysiology. But if they're not willing to do the tr trials in action and just relying on anecdotal data, it's probably not going to be good. And then there's the artificial vision. We've been part of the of the um, of the Argus II implant. We're supposed to be doing some. The problem is the implants, these chip implants, the current generation. It's a big surgery. It's going to be a five-hour surgery to implant this. It's a hundred thousand dollar of uh, of equipment, of ancillary equipment to do this. Insurance companies have been fighting it tooth and nail. They don't want to spend it. And we retina specialists, at least the ones that have put this in, and I haven't put any in, say the benefit is modest at best. You know, some patients don't, you know, they try it and they, they don't like it. Well, they've just spent $100,000 of someone's money on this. The, um, and the kind of vision that they get out of this is, with the current generation, is six by 10 pixels. So they're living on 60 pixels. They kind of, their perception, although they can kind of vaguely make out shapes, uh, some, of, some of them just describe it as kind of sparks, so they see sort of flashes. So it's not, hopefully the next generations will be better, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Some people are looking at even cortical implants, and the first cortical implants to just bypass the whole, the whole eye. That's gonna take, that's gonna take another years, if not decades, to see if that can be so we're not going to cover everything in my talk. I, I usually break this talk in, up into macular dystrophies and retinal dystrophies. So we'll just kind of finish up by talking today about cone dystrophies uh, and a couple other uh, uh, more pan dystrophies. This can have a wide range of manifestations. Certainly the most common cone dystrophy is just uh, color blindness, which is 3 to 6% of males have this, so have defects in the cone, in cone uh, pigments. Uh, there, this can be a little bit of a, pro, of a challenge because I see a lot of what I, what I call macular cone dystrophies. They just seem to be limited to the macula, the cones, their vision kind of goes bad centrally. But there aren't a lot of genetics that really are very fruitful in figuring out what these patients have. Uh, but there can be progressive cone dystrophies, cone rod and rod cone dystrophies, and then the most severe one is achromatopsia where you really have no functional cones. There's some gene therapies that are coming up. They're trying to recruit for them. I rarely ever see an achromatopsia. It's just not common here because it's not common in my practice. 
but um, people with cone dystrophies have loss of color vision, loss of central visual acuity, so this is kind of the opposite of RP. They very commonly, they have a lot of photophobia, um, they have preservation of visual fields. If they have it really bad, they'll have nystagmus and bullseye maculopathies. The the most important things to know about cone dystrophies is the family history. Uh, you do the workup is very much the same. This one, I I respect it very. You know, I, I worry about cone dystrophy diagnoses in young kids at least because that can be a sign of really bad things. And so, does anyone know what I'm really referring to? And it's it's the Batten. yeah Batten's disease. And I've picked that up in a couple kids when when you do the genetic testing and Batten's disease is a really devastating diagnosis to be, to be the first line, and sometimes as an ophthalmologist, you're the first line person that has to tell the family, well, this is a condition that not only do you have a visually impaired kid, but this, this kid may die in the next five to 10 years. And that's, that's tough. And um, so fortunately, we don't see it too often, but it does happen. And I've also seen in the days before genetic testing, it was clear I was missing this. I'd see the kids at seven years old and say, well, he doesn't see all that well. And then they come back at age 14 with seizures and all sorts of other developmental problems and that. But I think now with genetic testing, we usually pick it up earlier. And the, the reason again for this is there are some clinical trials. There are, for, for, for rare forms of Batten's disease, there are some interventions for that now. Um, but in terms of treatment, you know, low vision services, genetic counseling, as we said, gene therapy and stem cells are kind of the future. The last thing is just remember that I did tell you about toxicology. Remember, not all RP is, is RP. So there can be pharmacological agents. This is canthaxanthin maculopathy, where people who are taking a tanning agent, basically, were crystallizing the carotenoid in their retina. That's, that's treatable by just telling them stop taking the, you know, stop taking the drug. Fortunately, something, someone with canthaxanthin maculopathy usually doesn't have a lot of visual symptoms. Uh, tamoxifen is another one that we see that you need to look at for, uh, for uh, you know, that can cause other problems, that can cause problems. And then we have chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine can cause bullseye maculopathies that can be conf confused with cone dystrophy. And other ones, ethambutol, tobacco, alcohol, etc. So, and it just kind of goes on and on. You know, there's, you know, ranging from Viagra. There's lots of things that we consume that are, that can be toxic to the retina. And so, and then just remember, not all RP is RP. It can be post-inflammatory, post-traumatic, idiopathic. Some patients have, if it's unilateral, if it doesn't, if it doesn't make much sense, you may you at least think about other possibilities. Uh, so, you know, that means asking past ocular history, might be unilateral, or the electrophysiology may be surprisingly good. And I think the patient in the bottom right, I think, is rubella retinopathy. And that, I've had that referred to me in the past. You know, patients, you know, are, are they going to go blind? The answer is no. You know, they, it's totally stationary. It just looks bad, but they, the, the damage was done when they were born, and it's not going to get any worse. So um, I think it's 8 o'clock. We will stop it. Retinal dystrophies. Any questions or comments at all?